and Peter, by the way, if you haven't, if I haven't met you, um, I'd like to do that afterwards. Um, we're reading James 4, as um, uh, Joel said. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. My name's Matt. Uh, I'm not a pastor here. I'm just a regular Christian. Um, I usually sit where you're sitting, uh, and uh, occasionally I preach for my own good and for your good, and uh, so that Rod and Mark and Joel can have a break, uh, but mostly so I can practice, uh, and it's good if you want to preach, talk to Mark or Joel or Rod and give it a crack. Yeah, it's good. Uh, there is going to be a question time later. There'll be a number on the screen you can te text questions to. So if you have any questions, please do that. And uh, I'll talk about them afterwards. Uh, before we continue, I'll uh, pray and uh, then we'll get into it. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, we can read your word, we can read it in our native tongue. Uh, we pray that you would give us humble spirits to not just be hearers of the word, but also doers. And we pray this in James, Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, if uh, this is your first time here, or you've not been to uh, any of the other talks in the James series, uh, let me warn you that James is quite black and white. Uh, and so if I say something that's quite confronting, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm just going where James, is go James goes. Uh, I'm not very good at telling people things that are hard for them to hear, and I don't have much practice at it, but I'm going where James goes. Uh, so far in the series through James, we've looked at uh, authentic faith, faith and deception, faith and favoritism, faith and works, faith and speech, faith and wisdom. And uh, what James wants for his readers is that they persevere through the trials that they're facing. Uh, now, so that's the summary. Now, we all want glory in one way or another, don't we? 
we uh, watch a band or we listen to a band that we love and we're like, man, I wish I could be like them. I wish I could play gigs all around the world. I wish I could uh, play with other incredible musicians. I wish I could have the money that they have. We want the glory that they have for ourselves. Maybe we watch sport. Uh, we watch some incredible athlete and we go, wow, I really like the athleticism that they have. Or I'd really like all the, the adulation that they get for being the best in their sport. Or successful business people, we hear of them and we go, wow, they're, they're a pillar of their, uh, their business and a pillar in uh, their uh, industry. I'd love to be like them. All of this is uh, evidence that we, we all want glory, we all want prestige for ourselves in one way or another. And there's no different in the church. I'm sure you've all been looking at uh, Rod and Mark and Joel and sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes going, man, I wish I could preach like them. I wish I could get up the front, have the hot lights in my face, look at, ev- look at the dark room and like get amongst it. How do we go about getting what we want? How do we get glory for ourselves? Well, the world has many answers. Uh, Maybe uh, one way that's suggested is asking people that you know to tell you of where you can make improvements. Another way is through teaching yourself through reading. So if you want to become an expert at something, read a a bajillion books on it and uh, there you go. Another way, and this is my favourite, the... uh, a video on YouTube from Business Insider gives seven ways that you can get what you want or that will help you get what you want. Give compliments, repeat things back, ask for more than you actually want, use a person's name when you're talking to them, listen more, flatter them, and this is my favourite, ask people for stuff when they're tired. (laughs) That's how you get what you want. And uh, if we think hard enough, uh, and we've been around the Bible, it's easy to see where this comes from. Uh, we, we read in the f- beginning pages of the Bible that we reject God's kingship over the world. We put ourselves on the throne. We want to decide what's right and wrong. We want to decide uh, for ourselves. And we know that all kings want recognition and praise and treasure and glory. So our text tonight uh, in James 4 shows us three mistaken ways that we can go after glory and also James offers three corrections for those and uh, we'll see that living humbly before God brings better and lasting glory. So in the first 10 verses we see that the mistake mistaken way of getting glory is through greed and James says humbly submit to God. These verses are closely linked to Joel's passage last week in chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, uh, where James is talking about uh, wrong wisdom and uh, wisdom that is selfish uh, and vain. And we can kind of see for ourselves that that's true in our passage as well. uh, When we think we want glory, we tend to think that we deserve it because... We are better than others, we're vain, or uh, we just want it, we're selfishly ambitious. And so, in the first three verses, we see that uh, these folks are greedy, uh, that James is writing to, and their greed is destroying the church. There's fights and quarrels, James writes that they desire but do not have, in verse 2, so they kill. I don't think he's talking about actually taking life, but the kind of malicious hatred of someone else uh, that uh, is wrong. And uh, so we can see that they've embraced greed. And there's a slide coming up that might help us to see how uh, embracing greed is uh, so terribly wrong. So we're greedy. Greed's a worldly desire because it displaces God with the love of more stuff as the ultimate good. And so, when we embrace greed, we embrace the world. Now, all through the book, James has been calling his readers brothers about seven different times 
He's calling the brothers, brothers exhorting them to different things. Brothers, uh, share with those in need. Look out for how you use your tongue. And then he calls them something else in verse 4. He calls them adulterers, cheaters, womanizers, prostituting themselves, people who have been cheating on God. God's made them and he saved them. He sent his own dear son to give them new life. And what do they say to him in return? Well, you know, thanks for everything, God. I know you've done a lot for me, but I've just some found someone better now. Isn't that just the epitome of sin? And this is coming from people who claim to be Christians. But James offers great hope in verse 6. He gives more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. And in verses 7 to 10, he exhorts them to repent. It's all kind of repentance language there. If you have questions about the devil in verse 8, ask about that in question time. I uh, uh, I'm not able to deal with it now but he says to his readers when who have had their sin exposed for the the terrible sin that it is cheating on God what does he say to them he says submit to God then come near to God and they can come near because of Jesus death on the cross in their place they're, they have a status before God as his child that's unchanging. Their walk, it seems, with God has been quite distant, but they can return to God. And so James says, return to God. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The way that they have been going, their, their greed, their, uh, their frustration at not getting what they want is kind of like... Uh, my little boy, Caleb, he's about one, and the other day um, we went outside to, this, to the slide, to play on the slide. So we go outside and Caleb's playing and it's getting close to his nap time. Uh, so I say, okay, come on Caleb, we'll go back inside. So I pick him up and we go back inside and I say, okay, it's time for your rest. And then he just loses it, yelling, crying, he full on headbutts me not happy he doesn't he doesn't want that it's good for him he doesn't want it but it's an immature response he ought to trust me he ought to submit to me humbly uh, because I'm his dad so what do, what do we do with these verse, first 10 verses well if you're a Christian here tonight then I'm sure at one time or another you've been guilty of cheating on God You've thought that something else is actually better than humbly submitting to God. And so you've gone after that. So James says, repent. Turn back from that. Change your thinking about it. Instead of thinking, mm, yeah, this is good. Think, no, humbly submitting to God is better. And rejoice. Because our God gives more grace. Rejoice in God's grace. Rejoice knowing that when you do return to him, he will welcome you with open arms. What Charles Wesley wrote a hymn uh, a while back, and uh, there's a great line in it. O Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I of sin. O Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I of sin. So if you're a Christian tonight, rejoice in the grace of God to you. And if you are here and you're not a Christian, then I hope this passage goes some length to help correcting a wrong view of God that you may have. Uh, God's not a gloater of, over wrongdoing of his people. He doesn't hold it against them forever. He doesn't go, ah, oh, you stuffed up, I knew it. But he shows more grace. There's more kindness in God than there is sin in us. And so if you're not a Christian here tonight, maybe change how you think about God. 
think about him in a bit more positive light as a, a God who loves his people and jealously longs for their affections. And maybe, maybe tonight's the night that you repent, that you turn back to God and accept the new life that he offers through deep Jesus' death and resurrection. So seeing that uh, these Christians are ruining their relationships in the church through, through their greed, and they can also ruin them in through slander in verses 11 and 12. And so James writes, the mistaken way of getting glory and honour here is through slandering other people and he says the correction is humbly loving your neighbour. So slander isn't a word that we talk about a lot but uh, I'm sure we know what it is when it's described. It's the kind of report against someone with the intent to belittle them or perhaps bring them down to pour on contempt, to mock them, to hurt them, to destroy or harm them in some way. And it starts in our hearts and our minds before it gets to our lips, doesn't it? It starts in the way we think of ourselves and someone else. It seems like uh, the selfish ambition and vain conceit of chapter 3 could be two possible motives for uh, this slander here in chapter 4. They might think, oh, oh my goodness, I could do f- such a better job than that guy. Can't you, like, do you see how terrible he is at preaching? It's just awful. Or it might be, oh, oh, they, I, I, I want what they're doing. Maybe if I cut them down, talking to the people that are around them, maybe I'll get their position. I'll become the home group leader instead of them. Something like that. And James and uh, and James says it's wrong. He says when you do it, you you really. Your problem is perhaps with the other person, but at its heart, your problem is with God. Slander, I think there's a slide for it. Maybe, yes, here it is. So God wrote in his law, love your neighbour. I slander my neighbour. By slandering my neighbour, I'm deciding when God's law of love your neighbour applies. Therefore, I'm setting myself up in place of God as judge of the law. That's what James means here. Again, it's kicking God off the throne and putting ourselves there and going, look, I know God, you say, love my neighbour, but I just can't love Norma. She's just horrible and I hate her and I'll love everyone else except for her. And it's wrong. Uh, I'm sure... Uh, you can think of times when you've said something about someone else that you shouldn't have. Um, uh, Sarah and Peter and I went to Ireland a few years ago and we went to a church there and uh, the preacher wasn't the regular preacher, it was someone else. And I didn't think it was a great sermon and so when I got home I was talking to someone about the trip and they're like, oh, you know, I, we, I went to this church and said, oh, how was the preaching? I said, oh, the preacher was rubbish. And my friend rightly corrected me and he said, no, 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 you can't, don't say that. You, maybe you could say his preaching was rubbish, but it's wrong to say he's rubbish. He's a brother in Christ. How can you say that? I'm sure you can think of examples as well. And our, frust- our deciding what the law says or when it applies is kind of like when we we're driving along, we, we want to get somewhere in a hurry, but the person in front of us just sticks to the speed limit. Oh, oh, isn't that so frustrating? It happened to me today, I couldn't believe it. I was thinking about this, I was like, as I was speeding around the woman, I was like, oh man, that's, that's so wrong. But, <laughs> but it shows, if the person's doing the speed limit and we think they're too slow and ought to get out of our way, well, yes, our problem is with the person, but not so much. Our bigger problem is with the people who decided what the speed limits are. And we're saying, look, you know, in this case, they got it wrong. It should be 55, not 50. So perhaps you're the kind of person who 
is cutting other people down behind their back. If so, stop it. Repent. It's wrong. And there are other ways that we can belittle people without opening our mouth, can't we? We might roll our eyes or, you know, when they're out of earshot, we just tell, make a little funny joke or maybe we tap our feet or we give a big sigh when someone opens their mouth. All that is communicating that this person isn't important. It's not loving at all. And it's another reminder, as Rod spoke about from chapter 3 a few weeks ago, of the power of poison words. So what are we, how are we doing as we think about the words that we're using? How do we consider the damage that we can do to the church just with our tongue, just with the words that we say? We also misuse our tongue when we boast about our plans in verses 13 to 17. Here James writes, Don't get glory for yourself through making money, but humbly plan, and humbly plan to do good. And this could be written for us, couldn't it? I mean, of all the parts we've read so far in James, he could be writing to our church right now. Who of us hasn't said, oh, by the time I'm 30, I'll have finished uni, got a good job, and, you know, have put a deposit down on a house. Or, before I have kids, I'm going to have a really good job, decent salary, and become, you know, pretty well known in my field. Or, I'm going to visit 100 countries before I die. Or a different country every summer holiday. This is the kind of thing that James is talking about here. He's not addressing the love of money, nor is he addressing... uh, this fear of commitment that's that we have he's not saying you know don't make any plans whatsoever but he's saying think of yourselves rightly and plan humbly before god because when we make these kind of bold statements that we we will do this by this time or we will do that we've got a, an incredibly overinflated view of ourselves don't we and an incredibly inflated view of our power to make things happen. What does James say in verse 14? Why, you you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So there's absolutely no place for us to be making these bold, grandiose statements when the God of the universe who holds the world in the palm of his hand might have something better in store for us. And again, James is talking about how how we use our tongue. He calls this kind of boasting, in verse 16, arrogant. He calls it evil. There, and so he says, you should say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. And so as, uh, as a church, we make plans which are good and right and for the proclamation and of the gospel. And uh, so it's right to go, well, if the Lord wills, we'll you know, have, a next, uh, have a new pastor sometime. Or we might say, well, we'll, if God wills, then we'll start some new ministries or something like that. We'll get some new home group leaders or maybe uh, on a more personal level you might say, well, if, if it pleases God, I'll buy a house in a few years' time or I'll, I'll buy this car or if God wills, I'll do the shopping tomorrow or I'll, I'll clean the house, Lord willing, or I'll brush my teeth if it pleases God tomorrow morning. There's a wrong way to to use this, this section. And because life is so unpredictable and because God is God and we are not, then we ought to plan humbly. If we have a look at a little graphic, 
that's coming up. Um, our power over circumstances is far smaller than the unpredictability of life. And James wants his readers to persevere through trials, no matter what they might be. And so we need a surer confidence than ourselves. We need someone who's bigger and stronger than us to trust in uh, to see our way through the future. And it's wrong, it's frankly, James is pretty clear here, it's quite wrong for Christians who claim to follow God to give no thought to him in the plans that they make. So that shouldn't be a habit uh, for us. So what do we do instead? Well, we make plans humbly before God. We say, well, if it pleases God, I hope to get a a well-paying job that allows me to give money to missionaries who are overseas sharing the gospel. Or if it pleases God, I hope to buy a house that'll be good for our home group to fit in and we can meet there every week and it's not going to be a burden for us. Or maybe it's a whole reversal of what we aim for in life. Instead of aiming for a good job and a good house and then, you know, a church that's close enough by that's not going to be too inconvenient, maybe we reverse that and go, well, if it pleases God, I'll find a church and I'll commit to a church there and then I'll look for a house that's going to be good for the ministry that I do at the church and then I'll, uh, and then I'll pray that God would find, uh, give me a job that uh, provides enough money for me to afford the house. Maybe that's a, a more humble way of making plans for the future. We all want glory. If we're honest, we all want glory in one way or another. And we don't want it for God necessarily, we just want it for us. We just want it for ourselves. And uh, I hope that you've seen tonight that James just throws this on its head. This uh, going out for glory for ourselves uh, is really quite destructive. It'll destroy relationships that that we have in the church, it'll cause us to speak ill of one another and uh, we'll just go through our lives with no regard for God. And James, what does James say? He says, go for future glory. In verse 10, James, James wrote, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. How do we know that? How can we trust that? How can we trust and believe that giving up all these good sounding things is actually going to be worth it in the end? Well, have a look at Philippians chapter 2. If uh, it comes up on the screen, we'll read this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And in the next part, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, except when he got to the cross, and then he told God that he'd had enough, that he deserved to go back to heaven and be crowned with all the glory that uh, he deserved. Is that what it say? Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that at all. What does Jesus do? Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the example for us that humbly living before God leads to better and lasting glory. He could have thrown in the towel, but he didn't, and God rewarded his humility. So we've got a choice to make. Do we go for glory now without humility? Get a little bit of glory, sure, we might become really important or something like that, but we put at risk God. We risk losing God. Or, 
do we go for humility now and wait for vindication from God when the Lord Jesus returns and we're gathered with him in the air and go to be with him forever? That's the choice we face. And if living humbly before God was good enough for Jesus, then it ought to be good enough for us as well. So, live humbly before God for better and lasting glory. Let me pray. Father, we uh, have had our sin exposed for what it is tonight, for our adultery before you, our loving Father. We uh, ask that you would forgive us for misusing our tongues uh, to cut it, to cut one another down, to boast about the things that we will do with no regard for you. We pray that you would help us to humbly submit ourselves to you, to repent and know the grace that you give. Help us to love our neighbour as ourself and help us to plan to do good and to hum- make humble plans before you, knowing that you are a good God who loves us and does things differently for us, for our good. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.